Hi, my name is Joseph Ally. Welcome to my channel. And today I want to talk about the guarantee of receiving your manifestation. What's going to happen if you imagine something and then you don't want it anymore? Or what happens when something is presented in front of you, you have some objective, some deadline. You imagine that deadline, that success before that deadline or at that deadline, and then it does not manifest there. What happens? We will talk about God as the, the, um, the he who will not return unto you void, meaning God is not a liar. That's his reputation at stake, meaning your consciousness is reliable, reliable at any given time. It could never be lackadaisical. It could never be random. It can never be hit or miss. Meaning, if you imagine something, if you want something, if you are attempting to create a reality, you must be able to depend upon that. And lucky for you, you will experience that reality. We will talk about the nuances related to this aspect, this observation of manifestation that I've witnessed dozens of times in my own experience and then dozens from with my coaching clients, my programs, um, the people who have received great results. And I want to essentially get you to a point where you will be able to be convinced that you yourself can rely upon yourself. So before we begin, please do me a favor, hit the subscribe button. It'll do something to the algorithm so that the people who wouldn't normally be able to see this video will be able to see it. Hit the subscribe button. If you like broken down, methodical, tested, scientifically tested results and observations, of systematically broken down manifestation techniques and hit the bell icon if you want to stay tuned for Tuesdays and Fridays. I release new content related to manifesting, how to implement it into a lifestyle in a predictable manner. So let's jump into it then. There's a verse for those of you who have your Bible with you or would like to look it up. The King James Version is that which I will quote um, from memory, if I can remember it, it's Isaiah 55, 11, and it says something to the effect, paraphrase, it says, so shall be the word that goeth from my mouth shall not come back unto me void. It must accomplish that which I had sent it, and it must prosper in the thing where I, wherewith I sent. Now, there are variations of this. You don't use, need to use the King James Version. That's what I learned when I studied the scripture in groups and um, learned the metaphysical interpretation of it back then, the Hebrew and the Greek, because it has some of the greatest um, supplementary materials, such as Strong's Concordance, things of that nature, some of the greatest books that are studied um, or that are study materials to the Bible come from the King James Version, but it's not plain English. It's written in Old English. But what that verse is saying is God's word cannot come back void. It must do the thing it was sent to do. It has to. There's another verse to supplement this one throughout scripture, which is that God is not a man that he should lie, which essentially is stating it's not much. It's not. It doesn't have to do as much with the fact that God is not a man, but it has to do. And that's for you out there who still want to run with the idea that you, the man, is God and not the consciousness. It says in scripture that God is not a man. But nevertheless, the point is, is the lying part is what we want to draw our focus to here. It says also God holds his stars in place. All of this has to do with the fact that he must be dependable and God is your consciousness. That is you, your consciousness. It says so in Exodus. In Exodus 3, 13 through 15 and 16, and I'll paraphrase some of that right now, that um, essentially Moses has... Now, let me, let me start with this by saying that the scripture in the way that I interpret it... Now, I used to interpret it in a literal interpretation back in the day, back before and when I had mystical experiences, which again did not compute because the way that I was reading it 
The mystical experiences that I had did not align with what I was reading, but it was because I was taught incorrectly. Now, luckily for myself and with gratitude, I have a lot of gratitude for how I was taught to study the Bible. Therefore, I was able to interpret it properly. Eventually, finding the connections between the metaphysical interpretation, the spiritual interpretation, the psychological interpretation, and what is written. So, but nevertheless, the point is, is that the um, God is not a man that he should lie. There's a consistency that is assured. We must be able to depend upon the word that is us. And as I said in Exodus, God's name is I am. That is who we are. That's our true self. In Exodus, it says, that, like I said in paraphrase, uh, Moses goes unto um, God and says to him, Who shall I tell the people of Israel has sent me? And really with that, there's a word in there that um, says, essentially when he's asking who, like meaning the name, who is the name of the person that has sent me? Really what that transliterates into is what is the mark of the of who has sent me and god says that i am is who sent tell them that i am is who sent you to them and then he says i am that i am which in the literal transliteration actually should be the mark that should tell people who i am is awareness so the word i am is that whole sentence, right? I am that I am. You go into the children of Israel, tell them that I am has sent you unto them. That is my name throughout all generations. He's essentially saying in transliteration that I am is the same word for consciousness. And behind the scenes, the Hebrew, the, there is a story that's happening behind the scenes in those verses from Exodus 3, 13 through 15 and 16, if you look at the Hebrew, it continuously uses the same phrase, the Jehovah or the yad He vav He, which transliterates into Jehovah, which then is transliterated again into God or I am. So there is the phrase Jehovah. And then the next, so it's, it, it essentially goes, I am that I am. And it uses a tense of the word to be, right? I am is a tense of the word to be. I am that I am. It's actually saying Jehovah El Elohim. So it is the process of God becoming man. And what I mean is if you read the sentence, those verses, sentence after sentence, and look at the Hebrew, it keeps saying a tense of Jehovah, then another word of Jehovah, then Elohim, then Eloah. All of those each individually mean God and then eventually to man, God in man's form. And so he's saying all around what he is saying. For those of you who are following or a little bit confused, the point of this is to tell you God is saying the mark of me is awareness. Anyone throughout all generation who is aware is me. That is God. And so the rest of scripture explains about the uh, personality traits, the attributes, the powers of God, which is the power of yourself. And God, one of them is God's word cannot come back void. And your imaginal acts are the word of God, right? God said things are created. So when you imagine, so it says in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, he said, let there be light and there will be light. So your manifestations that occur are happening from what you say, which is essentially your imaginal acts. So God's word, your imaginal acts, must not come back void. They must accomplish that which they have sent to do and prosper for wherewith they have been sent. So your manifestations do not fret, do not worry. God's reputation of holding the stars in place, which means existence itself, depends upon God's integrity. Awareness itself is God. So therefore, the reason I say that is do not worry, do not fret. You will manifest the thing that you want. The only requirement, and in scripture, a lot of it is dedicated to the process of teaching an individual how to activate and utilize your power of God. 
Now, when we talk about awareness itself, this is the key to creation. Now, in the name, really, it's the symbols of yad Hey vav Hey, which transliterates to Jehovah, which transliterates to God, which translates to I am, and that's awareness and consciousness. And then it says, you are the temple of the living God. So you are that God, right? It says, to utilize that power of God, what you must do is imagine what you want as if you already received it. Now, there are numerous verses placed together that teach this to you. I could be wrong. I think it's Matthew 6, 6, but it talks about what to do in order to receive your manifestations. It says, whatever you desire when you pray, enter into the closet and shut the door. Pray to your father that's in secret, and the father that's in secret shall reward you openly. The father is consciousness. The closet is closing down your senses to the outside world. Now, if you close your your um, your mind and body out to the outside world, the only thing left is the inside world. When what's the inside world? Your mind. How do you talk to your father in secret? With your inner mind, your imagination. Your, your imagination, your mind itself is that which hands over to God, which talks to God and tells him that which you want. So it says, pray to your father in secret and your father who hears you in secret shall reward you openly. The opposite of secret in the mind is the outside world. So that is how clear cut it is. Now, if you want to know specifically what that means, what's the actual process of speaking with your father in secret? So it says, whatever you desire. When you pray, believe you have already received it and you shall have it. Now, prayer is the act of speaking with your father in secret. We've already demonstrated what that is. So if you yourself have a desire, you have a person, you have money that you want, you have some trait, some aspect of being, it exists already. There's a verse that says there is nothing new under the sun. That means everything exists now. Another verse, I believe it's in Matthew, in my father's house are many mansions. Father, right, is consciousness. Many mansions, well, there's no mansions in the skull, in Golgotha, which is the place where Christ was crucified, and Christ is a version of God, meaning you you are God. So in your mind, there are no mansions, right? But but there are in consciousness, in awareness, in your imagination, in eternity. There are infinite states that you can utilize, that you can access. And if you enter into there by imagining you have already received it, you have already experienced it, then, well, God's word can't come back to you void, so you must experience it. The point is, is whatever you want, what do you want? Do you want a husband? A lot of my coaching clients, they come to me and it's a simple, usually it takes a couple uh, uh, sentences to crack the problem. I can't manifest my specific person because of this, or I'm stuck financially because of this. And I've tried this thing and that thing. How easy it is oftentimes to bring it back to the basics. And for me personally, have been doing this for so many years, have been testing this for so many years, have been observing results tens of thousands of results that I've logged and tracked for so many years, most of the time, if we can break it down, it comes back to the basics. Imagine the end and God's word cannot come back to you void. A lot of lack of faith comes from there, a lot of misguided information. Now, for those of you who are under the illusion that in order to receive you must continuously expect that it is going to happen. It says in scripture that things might happen so that you will believe. Your job is to imagine something as if it has already happened and you do that to your father who is in secret. That means with your eyes closed and you've shut out the rest of the world. That is when you imagine. And if you do that, that is all you have to do. It is not about walking around in your daily life, pretending continuously. No, you can expect that the work that you have done will not come back to you void. That is something I have taken to heart, but not out of blind faith, 
because I have tested it many, many times. And you will receive that thing, whether it is today, whether it is tomorrow, whether it's in a day, a week, a month, a year, it must come back. It will not be void. Now, here's the interesting part. Now, what happens, for instance, I'll give you a couple quick examples based on real life stories that I've experienced. What happens when you imagine that you're going to, for this is a simple one that I've experienced so many times. What happens when you have imagined that you will get that free thing, that free cup of coffee when you're waiting in line at the coffee shop, right? You know, whenever. And you get to that counter and you have to pay. What happens? So the next time, this has happened to me countless times, which is when I started to catch on. What happened next time? I went to the coffee shop. I didn't imagine anything that time and I got the coffee. Or the contest. You go into the mall or the shopping center or you're stopped on the corner by a man who's holding a contest and he asks you to enter or you write your name and number on a slip to enter to win a free trip or something like this at the mall or the, I don't know, the grocery store. And you imagine that you've won. You put your name in the slip, you give the guy your number, your information, what, what have you, and then you never hear back. You lose that contest. What happens? But then another one appeared. Another one appeared for me. I experienced that one presented itself. I didn't imagine for this one, but I entered and I won. Right. Or so those are two examples I want to start with by explaining the simplicity of the imaginal act and the seed of the appointed hour. So all things in this world are created. They are manifested. Your experience itself has been manifested by you. Your experience. That doesn't mean your universe has been created by you. That means that which you are aware of is being drawn in specifically because of that which is on your consciousness. It's a very important distinction, by the way. But the point is, is if you go into the shopping center and you see... You never imagine winning any contest in your life and you see and you witness a stand where you can win and you close your eyes and you imagine that you've won it and you put your name and number in or whatever and you don't win. The reason is because the fact that it is already there means it has, it is already a part of a manifestation of four. It has already been created from before. It's already a part of God's word, not coming back void from something that was a day, a week, a month, a year ago. Now, is it possible to enter into that competition or contest and win on the dime? Yes, it is absolutely possible. But if you don't, it usually is because it is already a part of another manifestation that's been set and that's essential, a crucial piece for something else. And then therefore, now you've imagined winning a contest. That, that contest itself that you've just imagined Right? God's word cannot come back void. So now another contest must appear. But now that contest is a part of this bridge. And this bridge is you winning. And so you put your name and number in and you win. Same thing with the cup of coffee. You already went to that store because of another bridge, because of another manifestation. It is already set. The events that transpire now are essential for something else. When we manifest, there is a bridge spanning into elsewhere. These events are stacked on top of each other perfectly. The moment we imagine them, they are conjured a miraculously perfect bridge of incidents. So they must not become invalid. And in order for that to happen, they must remain as they are. So when you attempt to change reality, this is why force does not work. This is why trying to forcefully change thoughts does not work. There's a manifestation set beforehand, such as a belief or a state, that's causing the thought already. Changing it is ineffective. You need to go to the core and change the belief. Or you go to the core and impress a new manifestation, a new desire for that to be experienced. And then you will. Now, what happens when you want a person? This is a common question. What happens when you want to manifest a specific person? You imagine them to the best of your ability. You do it time and time again. And then all of a sudden, someone else swoops in and picks you up and you like them and you fall for them. Well, what about that? I thought God's word can't come back void. What's going to happen with that dude? What's going to happen with that chick that you've imagined being with? Well, I have interesting stories. But suffice it to say 
there are some observations that you can say are true. Now, God's word cannot come back void, which means those seeds that are planted must exist. But interestingly enough, if you've ever experienced a bridge of incidents where you obsessively remain in a negative state, you're not in the state conducive to receiving your manifestation due to a mindset, you delay the manifestation indefinitely. Likewise, if I had, I give this example many times, it's very, very uh, uh, crude, but imagine Mother Teresa being a murderer. What would it take for her to become that? A tremendous bridge of incidents must unfold in order for that to happen. But if she never enters into a state that is conducive for receiving that manifestation, right? And usually this is through awareness itself, meaning she must be acutely aware. If, if you're acutely aware of being a good person and you act day in and day out because you have that intention in your mind, you actively fight and try and do the best that you can, that means you're actively aware of, of your thoughts and doing the right thing. And therefore, thoughts that come in that would whereby cause you to act a different way are going to be battled. And therefore, you'll be delayed. So those manifestations will still be in the ether waiting for you to enter into the state to receive them. But until you enter into the state to receive them, they will be idle. They will be indefinite, so to speak. So in other words, when you're with this person now, you're with John Smith, but you manifested you were with, um, I don't know, whatever, someone, <laughs> uh, the guy next door, what's going to happen? Will you in your happy marriage or happy relationship remain there? You're in a state of being in a relationship with John Smith and there you will remain continuously. Thereby, the neighbor will remain an indefinitely suspended yet accessible manifestation. Now, if, and I've seen this before with my own eyes countless times, if you became unhappy with John Smith and left John Smith, the neighbor next door would likely come in. I have witnessed this firsthand. I've seen this time and time again. So the point now... The next question that's going to come up is, well, what happens if the person that I want to manifest is aware that they don't want me? Are they going to be able to stop that? So you also will be compelled as, so for instance, when I talk about manifest, manifesting beliefs, right? I write them down on a piece of paper. I am this. I have this. I am confident. I am secure. I am rich. I am handsome. I am this. People tell me I'm this, whatever. What I'm essentially doing is setting something, right? And now God's word cannot come back void, which means I must now become that person. Now becoming that person actually means I'm entering into a new state. So can you force someone into a new state? Absolutely. That is what is happening day in and day out. And the way that happens is thoughts. The best way to make that happen or, or to, to explain how that happens is that person will receive thoughts, their own thoughts from their own mind that essentially will make them act in specific ways, think certain things, do certain things, experience certain things, and they will become that person slowly but surely, right? Manifestations are not measured by time as we've proven in my last few videos. They're measured by events and events themselves don't just constitute as experiences related to a specific event that occurs through time, an event or experience also is a thought, a feeling, um, a memory appearing, um, a, a word spoken, an intuition, a revelation. You will receive, you will receive your manifestation. If you imagine someone, so the, the way that I have seen this essentially be delayed is if a person is actively aware that you're manifesting them and they wholeheartedly are actively aware, consciously, actively, like truly forcing themselves continuously to not be affected by this thing, then for that time being, they will be unaffected. However, that's it's it's not necessarily so because they can receive thoughts, as I've just said before, unrelated to the manifestation whatsoever, unrelated to you that will cause them to do certain things. 
and they still think I'm not going to, I'm not going to get with them. I'm not going to get with them. And then boom, because they went to go get that coffee, they bump into you, see you. They're like, wow, she's beautiful, whatever, what have you. It will cause you to act in certain ways too. So truth be told, nothing really can prevent you from getting your manifestation. The the God's word cannot come back void. There can be delays based upon states, but God's word must, his whole reputation as a creator living within you, the universe is held in place. The stars are held in place through God's word, which is his bond. He cannot lie. His word must come back. It cannot come back void. It must accomplish the thing that you've imagined. It must. Your imaginal acts are the word of God. The word of God essentially translates also as the word logos, which is meaning, M-E-A-N-I-N-G. So word is not just a void word. Everything has meaning. Everything has meaning. It's not just lackadaisically random. So anyway, get your manifestation. Don't worry about anything. He will not reject you. You can essentially remain in a state with an indefinite suspension of a manifestation. If you're worried, don't worry. Just live your life acting from the point of view of the person that you want to be. If you want to change that, change your state by imagining. God's word cannot come back void. Manifest anything that you want. Thank you so much for watching this. Um, I really appreciate this. This this topic was brought upon me by a coaching client that I had the other day, just referring to how manifestations unfold and why certain things seem to be getting delayed and then coming after with a new experience. So that was very helpful. I really appreciate my long-term viewers, subscribers, clients, their opinions, their ideas for videos. Um, really helpful for myself. I love talking about the nuances and ins and outs of the observations that I've experienced over tracking manifestations for over a decade. I have essentially, um, not essentially, literally, I have a stack of journals, probably, I don't know, a foot and a half high related. All of those are manifestation tracked. So from beginning to end, and then the analysis thereof. And so over the decade, or, you know, it's over a decade, but um, thousands of manifestations tracked. And not only that, my clients as well, coaching clients as well, I spend a lot of time analyzing, interpreting, you know, to, in order to help them get their manifestations. But nevertheless, the point is to analyze them and observe them to find the commonalities as well. So those things which I share are not beliefs, their observations. And nowadays I have my girlfriend to share this stuff with and we talk these these things through and find these commonalities as well. And this is her experience as well, which is amazing. So I hope this was helpful for you. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button if you like these broken down systematic framework analysis of manifestation techniques and processes. If you like the Bible stuff, let me know if you like the metaphysical interpretation of the Bible. It's been something I've been studying for over a decade um, um, in, in depth. Um, I liked, um, I'm curious to know who's interested in this and who would like to learn more. I have been trained officially, um, on how to interpret the Bible and metaf metaphysically. I've taken uh, official courses and I used to be a part of a, what, what you would call a cult, but really it was, um, you know, in my opinion, it was called a uh, fellowship and it was essentially, I used to daily, um, study the Bible, uh, literally, with um, the Greek interpretations, the Hebrew interpretations, like actually reading that and then deriving from that a lot of what I know today. So anyway, subscribe, bell icon if you like this and want to stay tuned every Tuesday and Thursday. And that is all. I will see you next time. Thank you so much.